Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, I guess we can stop talking about high school. And all <laughs> of that. Oh. Can the inside scoop? Hello, and welcome to another author event at the Poison Pen Bookstore. I'm John Charles, and we're delighted to have back with us, after far too long a time, New York Times bestselling author Christina McMorris, whose new book is The Ways We Hide. Um, for our program tonight, Christina has some kind of digital tech stuff she's going to share with us, then we'll talk about the book. We'll allow a little bit of time at the end for questions you may have, and then Christina's happy to sign books for you. I do want to say she's flying out tonight, so we're going to keep her on a tight schedule. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome Christina. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for having me. Good to see you all. Ah, oh, in-person events again. So excited to see real faces. So first of all, thanks for having me. I'm Thank so you. excited to be back here again. And I have a lot of fun things to share tonight because it, my new shiny toy is my new book. And I worked on that for a couple years through apparently something happened in 2020. I was just in my cave the whole time. So you have to catch me up. Um, and so I will share today a little bit about the research and where the idea came from. And for those streaming back there, if you don't know what the story's about, we'll fill you in on that too. So a little a short slideshow here of some fun things that I can't wait to share. Um, so the ways we hide, where the idea came from, a lot of people ask, you know, where ideas come from for novels. In this case, it was similar to my last book, Sold on a Monday, which um, some of you are probably familiar with that, of course, that insp was inspired by this photograph that stunned me as a mom, of course, especially of four children being offered for sale from their own soup in Chicago. And if you, you know, want to learn more about that, um, you can go on my website and whatnot and, and social media because the oldest girl in the little white dress, Ray Ann, she and I became friends before the book came out and went on the Today Show together. And she told her story in her own words, which is really remarkable. So it's worth watching. Now, that one obviously inspired Sold on a Monday. Um, that was the day that I went down the rabbit hole of the website. We've all seen that link, right? That says 50, the most shocking historical photos you have never seen. And you think, what 50 photos have I never seen? Especially as an author, go down the rabbit hole. And I found that photo and I found one more on the same day that I haven't shared until now. Now, it's a bit unsettling. Um, it's about a tragedy with children. So I'll go ahead and just give you that quick warning. You can look down, look away if you want. I won't stay on it very long, but it's not right to not share it since it inspired the whole book and it did happen. So this is the photograph that I came across on that same website. Now, the kids look so peaceful and calm and hardly any marks there. I thought that they were sleeping until I read the caption. And the caption ends up talking about the Italian Hall disaster in Calumet, Michigan in 1913. And for those who live in the Upper Peninsula, they may have, be more familiar with, than a lot of people around the country. And it was so stunning, this story, I thought, how had I not heard about this before? And you know about it from the story. So I'll move on and let you know a little bit very briefly about what happened on that Christmas Eve in 1913. There were the copper miners in the UP, and they were on strike. They were trying to unionize. Now, they were fighting for some simple things like $2 a day and safety conditions, et cetera. And this, you know, battled it out for months and months. And eventually what happened was they were having trouble feeding their families, of course, let alone buying Christmas gifts for their kids. So the ladies auxiliary group decided to throw the kids a Christmas Eve party in the Italian hall in the middle of town. Now, if you see kind of from where you're seated, hopefully you can see that arch that's on the left side there. And that is the entrance to the upstairs where they had the community hall. So that was the stairs that went up and down to there. Now, what happened is they had this Christmas party and a woman who was six feet tall, Slavic woman named Big Annie. Big Annie went around town and asked for donations. And you can imagine how that went. Nobody says no to Big Annie. So she got $60 worth, a lot of money, bought all these little treats and candies and put them in barrels on the stage. They had St. Nick there. 700 kids show up to this party. They have this whole you know, play and music and whatnot. The night is winding down. And what happened was a man came up the stairs to the landing. They believe he had an anti-union pin on called the Citizens Alliance, and he yelled a false cry of fire. Now, most of these people are all immigrants, so a lot of them didn't understand. He yells it again, word spreads through the crowd, and it becomes panicked. He takes off down the stairs, and you can tell what's gonna happen here, right? It triggers a stampede down the stairs, and within minutes, this room is cleared out, 
And now they have something called vertical stacking that happens in the stairwell. So within 10 minutes, 100 people were in the stairwell and unfortunately 73 people died. Vast majority of them were children. So in some cases, an entire family was wiped out. Another case, a couple lost all three of their children, which you know from the story, that one haunted me. And I thought, I, mean, I can't imagine losing one child, let alone all three of them. So that weekend, they had a procession of a funeral for so many of them all at once on the same weekend. And they went from two to three miles all the way to the cemetery. 15,000 people lined the streets, including about 10,000 that were minors from other counties that all trained in on their own dime in order to, uh, to support them. The vision of that, when you see more pictures online of 73 caskets, but most of them small white ones for children, which is heart wrenching to me. So this image haunted me, the story, why have we not heard about this before? I put it in my file folder because I couldn't let it go, but it also seemed way too sad for an entire novel. So I promise fun things are coming, people. You all came <laughs> for the jokes, right? Okay, we're moving on. So I put that in my file folder and right next to it, I call it my desperation folder because I always think I'm never gonna have another idea for the rest of my life. <laughs> Unless my editor is asking, in which case, Shana, I have so many ideas, I will never run out. <laughs> so in the file folder, right next to that photo is, was this article that I'd saved years ago when I was researching World War II, how Monopoly helped win World War II. Now it's just kind of this fun fact about how Monopoly boards, among other pastimes, had helped smuggle uh, escape aids and evasion tools uh, to allied POWs that were in camps during World War II. So they had actually put in, which is amazing when you look at this board, this is my UK board. Yes, you wanna know where I got it. It was all about eBay. <laughs> so it's amazing what you can find. So this is a UK board from World War II. You can see all of the avenues, of course, are from the UK and also all in British pounds. What they did inside the board is incredible. So they went to a secret room. They had to sign the Official Secrets Act. They couldn't tell anybody, all classified. And the engineers cut into the board and put two files, a compass, and a silk map inside. Then he put the sticker over the top so it looked like brand new and you couldn't tell it ever been tampered with. And this, we know they existed, although none exist to this day. Um, so there are secret memos that went back and forth. So that's how we know that they really did did they did use them. And here is a secret memo then that talks about the samples they needed and which region the map they needed inside of each, of each board. Now the way that they told you which uh, map would be inside was that they put a dot by certain avenues and then you knew it was France or it was Germany or Belgium, for example. Now, what's fun about this, of course, is that this gave new meaning to get out of jail free card. <laughs> <laughs> and they created these uh, fictional charities. So they wouldn't use the Red Cross as a name because it would violate Geneva Convention. But they did create these charities that they used addresses from bombed out buildings from the Blitz. And they would be as daring as naming these charities the Travelers Association, <laughs> which I thought was very clever and a little bit on the nose. So the man who um, was behind all of this, the head of the MI9 gadget department, was Christopher Clayton Hutton, and he went by Cletty. So the reason he was put in charge of MI9 is too good of a story not to tell. He interviewed with the war office. He'd been an RAF pilot leading up to World War I. He was also a film publicist and a big self-promoter. So he had been obsessed with uh, magic and Houdini for a very long time. Uh, the short version is he had challenged Houdini to get out of a crate on stage. Houdini was welcoming those challenges for 100 pounds, and he ended up losing um, to, I should say, Houdini won. Cluddy lost, but he made a big bragging point in his life, and he would carry around a letter in his wallet at all times that was Houdini saying, challenge accepted, as one does. <laughs> so you know he was looking for an excuse to pull that out, which he did, and because of that tie-in, the head of MI9 then said, come with me, we're starting a new department, I think we can use you. So he got put in charge of this go-go gadget team, is what I call them, British intelligence. And together, Christopher Clayton Hutton and a man named Charles Fraser Smith, who was a civil servant then, who served during World War II, made gadgets for MI9, uh, sorry, MI5 and 6, 
We all know them, right, from Mission Impossible. Um, and so those two figures together believe, are believed to have inspired the character of Q from the James Bond film series. So it all comes together, doesn't it all make sense? So um, the one thing that I have to share before we move on from there is to let you know about Houdini. And as you know, John, um, in the story becomes pretty important as well. Houdini becomes a, a big figure, even though he isn't alive in the story. And the reason I have to mention him is that aside from uh, inspiring magic and illusions, of course, for my character, he also in a biography I read about him about, that came out about six years ago, it, it showed a lot of evidence to point toward the fact that he was a spy against Germany leading up to World War I. Now, when you sit and think about the details of how he could do that, it makes perfect sense, right? He, they, he got to travel around Europe at will. Nobody questioned all the trunks and gadgets and escape devices he's carrying around. He's invited to every palace, every leader's home to perform. And not only that, in every city he went to as a promotional tool, he said, I will escape out of your maximum security prison. And it got a lot of attention. And then supposedly he would go back and report back to Scotland Yard. So you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> Stranger than fiction. So knowing that MI9 actually recruited you know, and worked with magicians and illusionists, I thought, oh my gosh, all of a sudden that day, I thought in about 15 minutes, I had two thirds of my story. It was like a movie in my head. And I thought the sad story that I thought people should know about, about Calumet, Michigan, suddenly became the backstory for my character. So if she was one of the few, that there were four or five survivors of that stampede that were in the stairwell, she would become obsessed with escape. She would need two ways out of every room. Houdini would become her idol. And because of that, she would get drawn much deeper into the war than she ever expects. So that became the, the premise of the story. And I will show you some fun stuff here. This is uh, the magician the named Jasper Mescaline. And he did work for British, uh, the British Army. He was the head of the camouflage experimental section in Africa. So he claimed to have hidden whole convoys and tanks and whether or not that actually happened is a big question, um, but you know he was a good magician and self-promoter. So, so that is the story that went down the line. And what we do know that he did, at least two things for sure. One is that he took this farm that is outside of London in Tempsford and turned, helped them disguise it as a disused farm which then if you fly over the Germans, it would just look like a farm that wasn't used. Um, and all of the night flights would come out of there. So this was actually a secret air base that even the locals said that they had no idea there was an air base there throughout the war. So that's how well they hid it, which I thought was very cool. And what you can still see to this day is this, uh, this barn that is called Gibraltar Barn. And they have kept it up and turned it into a memorial then for the SOE, being the Special Operations Executive. You probably read about them, the incredible people who were spies, a lot of women especially, and the OSS. And so many of them went through this barn then right before they flew out to be what they call kitted up, put on their parachute packs, and make sure that everything on them would not give them away. So you're talking about older clothing, because new clothing was not happening there over in Europe, right, during World War II, and making sure that everything was sewn the way that, for example, if you were dropped into the Netherlands, that all of the clothing would be sewn just like that, that they wouldn't be sewn so the buttons were more French, for example, that you didn't have any ticket stubs from a restaurant receipt or from the train in your pockets that would instantly give you away. And of course, all these people were trained as well in the culture and the language, but also to not do something as simple as look the wrong way as when crossing the street, which some did and were captured immediately because of that. So all those little details. So we know anyway that that was some of what the magicians helped out with. And here is such a fun video. So here is a replica card that I own. I don't have one of the real ones. Um, there's only one known map deck apparently um, still in existence. It is on display at the National Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. So far, they have not lent it to me, but I'll keep trying, right? <laughs> um, unless some of you want to meet me and we'll go get it, just dress in black and we'll meet at midnight. So here is a replica um, map deck, like I said. Looks like a typical bicycle card. And this would be sent in to the LAPOW camps as a pastime. They, you put it in water, and about a minute or two later, you'll see that it splits apart. 
and on the back you've got maps then and you take 52 cards and you spread them all out and now you have a whole map of the area isn't that fun now here is an airman's for example pencil it's got the crown on it you just take off the pencil clip you put the you put the uh, clip on top and like i said a map and a compass are the two most important things to escape it's magnetized to point north so now you've got a compass in your hand and nobody would suspect right a pencil clip now here's christopher clayton hutton again sitting with some of his gadgets he looks very you know q in here from james bond and i do love talking about this boot because uh it is in the story and being also a self-promoter like the other men he named it the hutton flying boots to make sure that everybody knew who created these boots they were very very smart and that this was an airman's boot and what he did is he uh he got the idea from a friend whose father was a neurosurgeon who used this saw i believe it's pronounced a geely saw and it's lightweight it's thin and very strong because it would cut through a skull for brain surgery so he got the Clady got the idea that you put that into the shoelace and hide that inside so now you have something that will cut through metal and then hollowed heel just like a typical magician, you know, you've got compass money to bribe, you know, um, a guard to try to buy a, a train ticket, for example. And you also have a little razor that is also hidden in cloth. You pull that out, you are able to cut around the little swoop that you can see around the ankle. And now the top comes off and you have a civilian shoe. So now your military boots won't give you away. And then this one here is so fun, also in the story, is a cigarette filter. They would make sure that cigarette filters and pipes, all of that were actually able to work as well in case they were ever tested. And so this one case, it works, except when you take the cigarette off, it turns into a very powerful telescope. <laughs> oh, fun, right? And then here's another fun one. This is gramophone records. Remember all those? They're very thick on both sides, two records, like a pancakes, and uh, like a sandwiching. And uh, in the middle, they would have then a pocket inside that you would put money, compass, maps, all of that. And here is a dartboard then that they put all kinds of things behind the dartboard. And you know, they'd also put things in dominoes and uh, chess pieces, uh, cribbage boards, anything that you can think of as a pastime, they would hide something in there. The irony of all of this is that the German guards allowed these things to come through. You wonder why they allowed so many things, right? They would check them all, of course, send through what they didn't recognize as a problem. The reason they did this largely was because they thought if we keep the POWs busy with these pastimes, they won't be busy planning escapes. <laughs> <laughs> Can't make it up. So they even sent in baseballs. So if you got three baseballs, it's, there's a reason. It's because each one of them had parts to a radio. Altogether, they made a full working wireless radio. <laughs> it's very fun. And toward the end of the war, the Germans got a little smarter and they put in x-ray machines. It took them time to get those resources, of course. And then they started catching a lot of the things. The amazing thing about this is by then with the radio, the POWs were able to radio back and say, please don't send any more. We don't have any more room to hide them. So this is how we know how many things must have made it through the lines, which is pretty amazing. Now on the right here is one of my favorite things, and that is a reversible uniform. Think about how it goes back to magicians again with quick changes. On the outside, you have an allied uniform. You flip it the other way. You could have a German uniform. It also risks friendly fire that way, of course. So the other way you could flip it, which you see there, is turning into a civilian suit. The exact reason that if you got out of camp then, you could make it to a train station. And then I've got two last videos here to show you that are my fun gadgets. It's a good way at work, right? When I sit there and play with these, like, oh, this is hard work. This is hard work. <laughs> and so here is a typical shaving kit. Expect all the servicemen, even POWs, right, to stay clean shaven. So you'd, you'd screw the uh, razor together there, the shaver, I should say. And then you take out the razor here. Looks pretty typical, standard, except in the middle, you see that arrow that's in the middle of the circle? That's because when you float it in water and in a puddle, it's magnetized to point north. So once again, you have one of the most important things. And the last one is my favorite. This is an airman's uh, just wristwatch then. You take out the crown. It's pretty typical back then. You can see how worn it is. Get something to pry it open with. And it is not a working watch. It's actually a floating compass inside. So once again, they'll get you to neutral territory, which is pretty cool. And then I will show you this. My show and tell portion is, this is a silk map then from World War II. 
And like I said, they would put this in the Monopoly board or they would also sew these into an airman's tunic, right? So that you have a map already inside if you needed it. And the amazing thing about these maps is that first of all, they are super thin. So this is the reason they printed on here is that you could print in color on both sides, right? So look at that. It's like amazing map. And it tells you the, let me flip this over here and go right side up. So you can see the, the regions that it covers. Now it's so thin, which is obviously a bonus for all the reasons I mentioned, but also really importantly, you could drop this in water or have rain hit it and it would stand the weather. And really importantly, if you were hiding and you crinkled it, it doesn't rustle like paper does to help give you away. So really, really, really smart things that they did. And then from there, I'll just say that this is Wilton Park that you'll read about in the story. And this is an estate there that they commandeered. And it's uh, a mansion known as the White House. And this is where MI9 moved here after their building was bombed during the Blitz. Nobody was hurt. Colonel Crockett, who was, who's in the story and who uh, was the head of MI9, not just the gadget department, but overseeing all of it, he was thrilled to actually move out into the countryside to an area called Beaconsfield. And the reason being that he was thrilled not to have what they called the pettifogging bureaucrats breathing down their necks. And also because then they also didn't have the men from parliament who felt it was ungentlemanly to be using charitable packages to trick their enemy. <laughs> so luckily, Cluddy had no problem with this or Crockett. And as you can imagine, Churchill had no problem with it whatsoever. <laughs> he thought it was great. Now, the other thing I will mention that they did out here too, before I move on, is that MI9 did not just do gadgets. You know, so the escape and evasion, of course, was huge in the gadget department. They gave those not just for POWs and airmen, but they also sent these over and snuck them in through spies, but also to resistance members in different countries all over. So it was pretty amazing what they did. Um, and they also, at MI9 here in this building, eventually also had bunkers underneath the ground that they held what they believe was top German officials that were POWs that they kept there classified. So just because you were in MI9 did not mean you knew at all what the other branches and you know and sections were doing. Um, and so that didn't really come out until many years later. And I will say what the work that MI9 did with the monopoly boards and the gadgets, if you hadn't heard of that before, it's because they kept it classified until about 1985. And the reason they did is because it was so successful, they thought they might have to use it again against the Russians during the Cold War. So now we get the benefit of learning about all these stories that many of them signed the Official Secrets Act and weren't able to talk about for all of their lives, which is amazing. And then this is my last picture here is the, um, so this is just the, the, the compound is what they called this of MI9, the gadget department then. So after they moved out of the mansion, they left all of the interrogations and all of that over there. And by the way, the POWs that they did hold that were German over there, the reason they say that they learned so much from them was because they kept them in their cells and they wiretapped them and just let them talk to each other all day. And that's how they gathered a lot of their information. And then here is where the gadget department moves. So Cleddy and my character Fena all moved over there. And that's where they put out so many of these, these items and that end up saving a lot of people. And they believe by the end of the war that we know in February of 1942, at least half a million gadgets had been sent out to distributed to all three of the service branches. So you can imagine by 1944 and 45, how many there were. And they do know that about 35,000 Allied service members did breach neutral territory, escaped and evaded. And there's no doubt that many of them used these devices, not all of them. So that's it. Do you all learn something? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that fun? It's just fascinating, Christina. Thanks. Um, I wanted to ask you a question because I found it interesting. You didn't start out to become an author. You call yourself an accidental author. <laughs> I do. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, absolutely. So for those of you who don't know, I, um, gosh, I always hate saying this in a bookstore and really hate saying it in a library, <laughs> but I was a non-reader. <laughs> I've done a lot of catching up since then. Trust me, trust me. Um, and it was, a, what, 2007, I guess, I decided to sit down and try my hand at a novel because who needs to read and be a writer? Oh my goodness, whatever. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know what I was thinking. Blissful ignorance, 
You know, I was pregnant with my second child. I was creating life. <laughs> I always say a book seemed pretty easy. So um, I sat down and, and wrote Letters from Home, which was inspired by my grandparents' World War II courtship letters. And of course, for those who know, you know that they only dated twice during World War II, exchanged letters the entire time. They fell in love through those letters, got married when he was on leave, and were married for 50 years until he passed away. And then Grandma said, would you like to see the letters? So seemed like a trick question, right? <laughs> you don't say no to grandma there. And I thought it'd make a great movie, like The Notebook meets Saving Private Ryan. And um, I thought it'd make a good Cyrano de Bergerac story. And I sat down and, and wrote that. And of course, accumulated rightful rejections <laughs> from the beginning and learned the craft more, read an enormous amount, interviewed a lot of World War II veterans, many of them gone now, you know, unfortunately, some of them were the real band of brothers and lived in the Northwest and I was honored to know them. Um, and so that's what happened. I ended up, and I will share this because recently people have been asking too, why do you think World War II is so popular now in fiction, right? You know more than anybody. And I think there's a couple of reasons. One is when I wrote it, Thankfully, I was blissfully ignorant of the industry. I did not know I was writing a book that wasn't, you know, sellable. trending. Yeah. Yes, that wasn't supposedly sellable. But it's World War II. Oh my goodness! Like we're just going to skip that whole time period. There's so many amazing stories from World War II that we still haven't heard yet. And so I was thankful I did not know um, until I got my rejection letters. When they started getting nicer, I think the drafts got better. And it was a lot of, well, you know, love the characters, love the story, but there's no market for World War II fiction, <laughs> unless you're espionage or thriller or a memoir, you know, being nonfiction. So I thought, well, that was helpful 350 pages ago. <laughs> it's already done. I'll just try my hand at it. And so I just kept trying, thinking I only needed one yes. And thankfully, it sold to New York House, to Kensington, and we, you know, got a two-book contract and et cetera. And when I sold it in 2007, they actually said, uh, sorry, in 2009, I sold it. And they said, you know what? We're going to wait to publish it until 2011 because we think the market is starting to pick up with World War II and we think it'll be a better time to release it, which was, you know, interesting. I think the Guernsey potato, mm, I always have to say, the literary the potato peel pie society yeah. came out. The postmistress, you know, the book started just really um, catching on. And I'm glad that I wrote a book that I just felt passionate about. So I, when I talk to high schools and colleges and you know, writers around the country, what I say is don't write to chase the trend. By the time you write it and hopefully get it published, you know, then traditionally at least, the trend may be gone. And I just learned that nothing sells until it sells. So I wrote a book that I was passionate about, a book that I'd want to read. And that's my best advice then. And I think a lot of authors are pulling, I know this for a fact, actually, because they're friends of mine, had written World War II stories before and were told it would never sell. So a lot of those people, too, started pulling them out of drawers and then revising them and putting them out to the world. I think you've written somewhere that you consider historical fiction to be literary Advil. <laughs> Can you kind of... Explain that. I do. Yeah. Yes, literary ad bill. It's so medical. And um, <laughs> what it is, is I call historical fiction that yeah. because I think of it as with ad bill, you get the sugar coating of a story on the outside and hopefully you don't realize how much kind of what I call good stuff in history you get on the inside until it's over. And then you can look back and think, wow, I actually learned a lot too. And that's my favorite part of being a historical author, but also a reader. You know, when I get done, when it's well-researched and you sit there and you read the author's notes, you know, you think, oh my gosh, I had no idea. And um, Kate Quinn is a dear friend of mine. She came to an event of mine the other night in Seattle and we had a fun back and forth and, and she made a great point. And that was, we were laughing about the far-fetched things that, you know, that you go, this is stranger than fiction. Mm -hmm. I mean, illusionists that are rec yeah. recruited by British intelligence. Um, and she said, you can almost guarantee with historical authors that if you read the book and you find something to think that is just so far-fetched. She said, the most far-fetched thing in your stories almost always is the one that's true. Yes, because we as authors would never dare to put something that far-fetched sounding in our book. Hmm. Were you always a fan of magic or did that kind of happen with this book? Um, um, I think so. I think I've always been a fan of like card tricks and sleight of hand. Yeah. I just think that's such a beautiful art and my, uh, but not to the point like this of reading 10 books on Houdini and watching YouTube videos. Oh, thank goodness for, you know, YouTube videos that you can watch magic tricks and how they do them and, mm. 
And, and I will tell you that in chapter one, I do give away Houdini's how he did the milk can trick, which is one of his legendary tricks. And so you got your money's worth just from that alone. Aren't you happy? <laughs> One of the things I found fascinating about the ways we hide was the um, parts in the Netherlands, in Holland. Yes. And is that because when you were referencing the Michigan area that it's initially said and there was a lot of Dutch immigrants there in real life? Or... Yeah, so that's so interesting how it ended up leading to the Netherlands. And mm -hmm. what's what's funny is, kind of funny, unless you're the author on deadline, and then when you realize, oh, that couldn't have happened, <laughs> then you get creative. Then you take hot, long, hot showers where it's quiet and nobody bothers you and you try to solve. And um, I had, I don't remember exactly why I came up with the her being Dutch, but I think it was because I knew Michigan had a lot of, like you said, a lot of Dutch immigrants. So, you know, and you realize there's all these towns there and cities, you know, that are Holland, Michigan, and they're all named after, after places in, in the Netherlands. Um, and I thought, oh, this is great, you know, and, and so I made her a, the daughter of a Dutch immigrant. And I knew nothing about that culture. And I, and, you know, they often tell you way back, right, they say, write what you know, mm -hmm. which, you know, is so silly because, yeah. I mean, we're only good for one or two books at the most, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not good for a career. And I think it was Jody Pico who said that I heard anyway that said, write what you want to research, what, write what you want to learn about, I think she said. And I thought, oh, that's, that's a great theory. So I dove in and I learned about their culture and their food and all these things and, and the languages. And that was, and we can touch on that too, one of the biggest challenges of this book was the languages. Mm -hmm. um, so learning about Dutch language and putting all this in there and I fell in love with the culture and food was so fascinating. And you get about halfway through the book and then I, you know, started, I think I heard something about how there really weren't that many Dutch in the Upper Peninsula, which is where the copper mines were. I thought, uh-oh, <laughs> what do you mean by not many? <laughs> so I do some research and I reach out to people there and park rangers and I get a list of you know, for example, miners' names from that era that were all copper miners. And I'm looking, and it even says, you know, where they were from. They were all immigrants, uh, largely Finnish, Swedish. I mean, they had so many immigrants, and I knew that. Why is Dutch not on the list? <laughs> I thought, okay, this is a problem. But I did find that there were some. They, I found like one or two names, and it actually worked out better. I thought, you know what, this is actually great because she feels like an outsider all of her life. So... She is Dutch, but it's not an area that they usually would settle in. So I really actually appreciated that. And as far as the Netherlands go and learning about what the Dutch went through during World War II was something that I felt that I hadn't really read about and heard much about. We you know, think of Anne Frank, and that's about yes, the only thing you... Exactly. You could, I was going to say exactly that. We know Anne Frank, and we really... I think most people don't know much past that. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't, anyway. We hear about the French resistance. You know, I'd never heard about the Dutch resistance before. So learning about the Netherlands and was a whole, could have been a whole other novel. <laughs> and just, and I'll mention briefly because I thought it was fascinating that, um, that Hitler really viewed supposedly the, the Netherlands and the Dutch people as the Germans' Aryan cousins. And that makes sense and physically. And he thought that he could win them over through the war. So aside from violating his non-aggression pact and raising Rotterdam after that little scary episode and they surrendered, he apparently thought that they really didn't have to treat them like the rest of the countries. And, and luckily, they, he did not win them all over. And, um, but there were a number of Dutch that, you know, that did volunteer. And 25,000 of them alone volunteered for the Waffen-SS. So they were, they were you know, serving Hitler. And all of the uh, patrollers at night really surprised me. I thought they would, you know, in the movie version, that this is going to be someday, very soon, <laughs> right? As Spielberg is watching this at home, yeah. um, <laughs> that I assume they'd all be German, right? You just picture the German asking for your papers, asking, what, you know, where you're going, telling you curfew. And instead, my Dutch historian, I had about 20 experts, by the way, who are all in the acknowledgments, who saved me from many, many mm -hmm. errors. A Dutch historian that said, no, they would all be Dutch. So I just didn't picture that, and I thought that was so interesting. So that I learned is. a lot that way. Your protagonist, Fena Boss, mm -hmm. is it? Mm -hmm. Was that um, luck, or did you plan on her name and how it kind of became who she was? Good question. Yeah. So, okay, so Dutch names are very difficult <laughs> for Americans to pronounce. A um, lot of consonants. You know, like it's, you know, kind of the flip side of the Hawaiian names, right? That have all of the words that have all of the vowels. vowels. And you think, how on earth do you pronounce that? 
And uh, so with Fena's name, it was, I had to look up names from regions. It was also names were specific to regions, et cetera. I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was a whole thing. Um, and I loved her name Fena because it reminded me of like Finn, of kind of an Irish name, but mm -hmm. but Fena being kind of a unique spin on that and, and easy for Americans to pronounce, easy for me to write. And I liked that she went by Fen. I thought it was a very sweet name um, and it seemed to fit her. Her last name, it with Americans would think it was Voss. I thought it was Voss. It's Fos um, oh. in, in Dutch, but we wouldn't know that. So unless you listen to the you know, audible version, of course. Um, and I picked it because it just sounded good together. I thought Fena Voss sounded good together. And so I went with that. It wasn't until I'm maybe two thirds through the book that I think at one point I thought, I wonder what the meaning of that is. <laughs> and I think that's I think that's if I remember right when I looked it up. And it turns out it means fox. So it makes sense that you pronounce it fos, right? So it means fox. So they give that name to even a nickname to people who are clever as a fox. And that seemed to fit her well. And the other reasons that I, there are other reasons that go with foxes that um, that I didn't learn until I studied them more through this book that I won't give away because it's a bit of a spoiler. Um, but you'll find out by the end of the story why it fits her. It was, I, I thought it was a brilliant move on your part. So Thanks. we'll just go with you new in advance. I did. I planned it all yeah. from the beginning. <laughs> brilliant that way. Should we take some questions from yeah. your readers? Yeah, absolutely. Anybody, any questions? I know I covered a lot. While you're thinking too, I will say about as far as language goes, since I mm -hmm. did touch on that, and uh, as you'll see in the story, language is one of the things I've done. Other languages and other books, Italian, um, Japanese, being you know my heritage, and then mm -hmm. Italian. I, I used to speak Italian through during college years, and and so those ones were much easier. Although I always check with people, you know, that that first language and natives with Irish, all all of the languages, you know, but even Irish, you know, brogue and dialects and and British, making sure that it's time, um, you know, era appropriate as well. The toughest thing I did not know I was getting myself into on this one was you had Dutch from the period, of course, but Dutch you also had German. I have Hungarian in there because of immigrants in Copper Country. And the Dutch and German is not that simple because you also had different classes and ranks. You know, if you were an officer, for example, you'd speak differently. And on top of that, you also had Dutch people who spoke German as a second language and vice versa. Mm. So Fena, being a person who speaks Dutch as a second language, English being her first, had to also understand enough German words that were very similar to Dutch that she could understand as well so that the reader is not also lost. So, yeah, that was a whole challenge. That was a whole thing. <laughs> yeah. You said that your grandparents spoke Irish back and forth. Yeah. And that, you know, they stayed there for the years. Is yeah. that really where your love of World War II came from, or were you interested in World War II before? So the question is, with my grandparents' World War II courtship letters, did that then lead to my love of World War II, or did it come before that? Um, you know, I think with World War II, Never to write about anyway, for sure. And, um, but I think I was always in love with the, the at least the glamorous idea, the romanticized version of the 1940s in our minds, right? With yeah. uh, probably largely from films, you know, about the 1940s music. I'm a huge fan of swing and, you know, swing dancing alone, but, you know, all of the, the swing, big band music, the fashion. Um, there's just, and the, the romance idea, right, of the soldiers coming home and the big swing around hug at the, at the, the train station with fog, you know, <laughs> with steam coming out of the train. Um, so I think I've always loved that idea and it's, and just being so in awe of that generation, you know, my, the greatest generation for good reason called that, um, and, and what they sacrificed. And then you learn about these stories that make them so human. I think we all took those history classes in high school, right? That um, that if we were lucky, I had a really good history teacher once, nobody knows, um, that was Mr. Malone, and he would dress up in costumes on a daily basis and stand outside the door and whatever costume it was that applied to that day, he made history fun. Now, aside from him bringing it to life and making it fun to see what he was wearing that day, uh, aside from that, you know, a lot of it, we all, I'm sure, agree. We, we memorize names and dates and numbers. It didn't mean anything to us. We memorized, regurgitated, we purged it. 
And so I, that's why I love historical fiction and also um, documentaries that are so well done today, you know, that, that make them so entertaining to watch and riveting that we learn so much and it makes it so, so humanized. And we realize they were us at a different time. Yeah, so, but now my respect for that generation and what these people did and the bravery of these people has skyrocketed. Um, I, can't, I will not end today without mentioning a Dutch resistance group that you just reminded me called the England Barters, and they're mentioned in my book. It's a name that we all should have known about, that we should know about today, and so I will share it. They were people who escaped during World War II when it was occupied by the Germans from the Netherlands, and they were brave enough, or maybe crazy enough, but certainly brave enough to escape by boat in the middle of the night through the North Sea. And when I say it, little boats. It is small boats and even two brothers escaped on kayak. And imagine going through the North Sea in the middle of the day, let alone in the middle of the night when you've got, you know, 10, 20, whatever, 40 foot waves most likely. You also have German patrollers going through the sea the whole time and the defensive coastline that they are also patrolling. Plus you have the possibility of allied planes coming over that are ready to strafe you in case they think that you're German. Or sorry, in case, yeah, in case that you think you're German. Um, so these England barters, uh, this, the rough translation is England farers or England paddlers, which I like that one. I thought that was cute um, and very literally fitting. Though there were thousands that tried this. There were a belief, if I remember right, about half that were never seen again. They were lost to sea. The ones that did make it back would go to London. They would debrief. They would give all their information to help. And then a good number of these people, this is what I can't get over, went back um, knowing what they were going into in order to help the Dutch resistance. And at that point, the German intelligence had captured, then you know, partway through the war, captured a radio operator from the Allies, knew their codes, and then knew every time they radioed in to say who was coming and how many when the drops were. So almost all of them were captured immediately um, and executed or sent off to camps and then never heard from again. Mm -hmm. So that is why we, that's why we need to study history and these people because what they sacrificed is beyond, I think, what we can all comprehend today. What were some of the challenges of writing a book with a dual timeline? There's a lot of moving pieces. How did you keep it all straight? Thank you. So do with the dual timeline on this mm -hmm. one. Yeah, this one was, um, you know, I've done ones that had present day and past and never wanted to do that unless I thought I could make the present day stakes as high as the past, which is tough to do with World War II, right? When, when the world is at stake. Um, and so I've only done that once when I felt that the stakes were high enough and the pieces we keep. Um, with this one, it was, I wrote it exactly the way you read it. So I did not move them around. Um, I, I wish I was capable of skipping chapters that are hard and go, I'll oh, come back to it. I cannot, it, I'm incapable, it is a flaw, <laughs> but I'll grow as a person someday. So I um, write it exactly the way that you read it. And I wrote, so I knew I saw that, that action in the beginning with an illusion, an escape that is, looks like it's going to go horribly wrong and the reader will find out how that goes as you go. Um, and so I knew that was the beginning and you would get, I knew that you'd get some backstory sprinkled in and you, everything that you are getting throughout the book, as you know, even if you don't think it's important, it is important. Everything is in there for a reason, and um, and I can't tell you how, but it will become important at some point. So it was um, sort of the the present day being World War II, and and then backing up in her life and showing you how she got to be where she is and all the things that happened, and they're very very important. And then catching you back up to World War II, and it takes off from there, and it's pretty much a fast roller coaster ride from there, right? Mm -hmm. It is. <laughs> what surprised you the most about the research you did for the book? that there was so much, <laughs> um, really, that there was so much. I mean, it really was enough research for three books, I say, at mm -hmm. least. Um, but there were so many things that surprised me that I came across of all the things I just mentioned, plus more. So even just studying illusions, you know, took, and Houdini, which is you know, kind of like small parts of the book, took so much research to mm -hmm. get it right, and I really wanted to get it right. So I will say I even created some escapes in there. So I like to say that if this whole writing gig doesn't work out, <laughs> I'm going to take my show on the road. I only have one good escape, but sometimes that's all you need. <laughs> so if you want to be my assistants, you're all hired. 
Um, so that should go well. But yeah, no, even learning about illusions and sleight of hand and what they called sleight of, what they called all the tricks back then. You know, to find out what they called things and the decks, the, the trick decks and whatnot, that, um, what they called them in the 1920s isn't necessarily what they call them today. So, oh, goodness, it's enough to give you a headache. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. I noticed your cover has this map hidden, like mm -hmm. the cards. Yeah. How much involvement did you have in cover design? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so, they, my publisher was amazing and ended up giving me so many options. Uh, I want to say we went through about 30, but it was kind of mostly all at once. It was like, here's these ones and these ones and these ones. And um, and the reason we ended up with that is, which I love, and, and the title is a whole other thing too, because that was not the first title, but it is my favorite title for so many reasons. When you finish the book, you go, oh, that's why it's called that. Um, but they gave me lots of options for the cover and because we just couldn't quite nail it. And unfortunately, about half of them, in my view, were spoilers without them realizing it. And I went, oh, these are spoilers. And I said, here's why they went, oh, of course, yes, yes, yes. Okay, that's half. <laughs> <laughs> and then one of my other things that I just personally don't like as uh, an author, but also as a reader is when they show the face. And for other books, other authors, it's just my personal preference, you know? So I don't like, unless it's a movie tie-in, um, having the face forward because I just, I like the reader being able to fill in what the person looks like. And so any ones that were face forward, I just felt like that wasn't my favorite for this book. And with the ways we hide, and it just seemed like it fit better to not. So brought it down to about three. <laughs> and I went, okay, these two I like, this one I love. And it was the teal that just seemed to jump off. Um, the, the way that you will view the cover when you start the book and when you end it will most likely be different. And that's what I can tell you about that. Um, the map curl, which I think is brilliant at the corner, was actually on one of the other covers. And so I said, I, we've got to have the, the map curl. It's brilliant and it makes it different. And, and they said, sure, we can, we can copy and paste that right on. So I was thrilled about that. Yeah. And I will say too, um, title wise, we went through so many titles. Um, I want to say, I think I first called it the banishing game. Yeah. Um, reminded me of kind of the, it had to do with magic and illusions and all these mm -hmm. things, you know, spies and whatnot. It reminded me of The Imitation Game, which is one of my favorite films of all time. World War II, Bletchley Park and all that. Mm -hmm. And, but then The Vanishing Half came out. And it was such mm -hmm. a big book that my publisher was like, well, is there anything else you can think of? So I said, sure, no problem. So for the longest time, my manuscript said, untitled Monopoly book. <laughs> <laughs> And, it, and I let that go for a long time, and I think it was about a year, and then my editor said, is there any chance we could play with that and <laughs> change, turn it into something else? And I'm like, yeah, 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 we will. So we went through titles and titles and titles, trying to find the right one. And I will say that toward the end, I was so excited about a different one. And I thought, this is it, this is it. It is those in the shadows. And I thought that is to do with escape, with magic, with spies, the people behind the scenes that do all these amazing things that we will never hear about, the unsung heroes. And so I loved it. It still gives me chills. And I thought, that's the title. I got very excited. And I gave it to them. And they were like, well, we like it. But we have other books coming out, too, that have shadows in them. And I'm like, oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> so I'm like, just call it Untitled Monopoly Book, you know? <laughs> I was joking, nothing else, just call it the. Wouldn't you pick that up just out of curiosity? Okay, there you go. So finally I said, all right, fine. So I, thanks to my kids, I brainstormed with them and we came up with the ways we hide. And I loved the title so much. And it was so simple that I thought this has to exist already. So I went online and looked for other books with the title and it didn't exist. And I thought, okay, not that I know of. And I thought, that's crazy. So it, it seemed perfect for it in so many ways. And at the 11th hour, right before we were going to go to press, I was not going to put a dedication in. And it was, I, you know, after several books, you think, I think I'm dedicated out. And then at the last second, I realized what I wanted for dedication. I emailed my editor and said, is it too late? And she said, no, we, we can sneak it in. She said, what do you want to say? And I said, it's for those in the shadows. Aww. And yeah, and it all came full circle. And it's in the back of the book. And yeah, so I, was, it, I think it worked out the way it was supposed to. I think we have time maybe for one more question before we let you sign books. Oh, it better be a good question then. Pressure's on you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, if not, I'll ask it. Yeah. Um, I know it's early days, but can we hope for something else from you in the future? Oh, yeah. So you're one of those people that come in the hospital and you're like, you just got a baby. When's the next one coming? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yes. Yeah, so what's coming next? Let's see here. Um, doing a short story um, that... Oh, you do have a book in October. I forgot about that. Oh, goodness, that. you're right. I should mention that first because yes. that is very mm -hmm. exciting. I'm working on a short story that I've got a contract, so I'll do that. Uh, apparently on airplanes, I'm supposed to write that, so we'll see how that goes. Because <laughs> um, I think this is a stop. I don't know. This is my flight tonight will be, I think, flight maybe seven out of 18 in two mm -hmm. weeks. So you're seeing me when I know my name <laughs> <laughs> and actually what city I'm in and the name of the book, which is really good. Mm -hmm. um, so what is coming next? Oh my goodness. I'm so excited to tell you October, which, you know, I don't recommend authors put a book out you know, six weeks apart if you want your sanity, but it is going to be very fun because it is a collaboration I did with two of my good friends named Susan Meisner and Ariel Lahan. You're probably familiar with the books. They're both wonderful best-selling authors and dear friends of mine. And so when Harper Collins comes to you and says, would you like to write, play with your friends and write a book and we'll pay you? We say yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we were thrilled and um, they said we could write about whatever we want, consider World War II maybe since we've all done that. Susan was brilliant in that she came across a documentary and brought it to us and said, have you ever heard of the Angels of Bataan? Mm -hmm. And I hadn't heard of them before. Ariel hadn't either. Uh, very unfamiliar. We should know about them. Once again, these women that we should know about, our people anyway. And so they were nicknamed that. They were dubbed that by the servicemen after World War II because they were so amazing. They were so heroic. And so these were nurses who served in the Philippines during World War II in 1942. They become friends right before the Japanese forces then attack and invade just like Pearl Harbor. So they had their own version of that the very next day after Pearl Harbor. And you can imagine what that did the country. We all know the, the Badan Death March, of course. Well, these nurses were left there as well and you never really heard about them. So somehow these women that were just tough as nails um, survived three years of the occupation um, our nurses are U.S. Army, U.S. Navy, and a Filipina nurse. They all have different experiences, but they also intertwine sometimes in their, in their experiences through the war and also separate at times. We don't know how these 80 women, 80-ish women, all survived the war, but they did. They went through starvation, three years of being POWs, the first American female POWs of World War II, uh, and they even helped save people around them throughout the whole process, you know, getting black market supplies and no resources. Um, and they also went through every tropical disease you can think of. So malaria, dengue fever, dysentery, beriberi, yeah. dysentery, all of that. And we're still saving mm -hmm. people's lives. So the amazing thing about them, even more amazing, is when the war was over and they were all liberated, they all live, and they bring the Americans all, the American nurses all back to the U.S. on a publicity promotional tour with MacArthur. So they, at 80 pounds, these women are put on makeup, go shopping, and now, you know, go on stage and promote, you know, patriotism. And, and they were happy to be home, no question. But they were also told, do not talk about your war experiences. So they would not let them write about it or talk about it. The only thing we can figure out is that it was because possibly they didn't, the U.S. government didn't want to highlight the fact that they abandoned these women mm -hmm. um, and were now, you know, being rescued only at the end of the war and what they had gone through without saving them. So a lot of these women didn't talk about it till the end of their lives. And then some of them, I think, finally said, forget you. I'm going to go ahead and write a memoir about my experiences and pass it along, which some of them did. But there's only a handful. And so the book is called When We Had Wings because of the Angels of Bataan. So October 18th and the books will be here mm -hmm. and, um, and we're excited for you guys to read it. I can't believe how quickly our time's flown by. I want to thank um, those of you that have attended, those listening in virtually, and especially Christina for writing thank such you. fabulous books. Thank you so much. And thank you again for all coming. Well, go ahead and get Christina set up here at the table. If you give us a minute or two, if you can fold up your chairs and just put them to the side, okay. um, she'll be ready to sign. Okay. Thank you, John. There you go, my dear. Thank you so much.